Hello, everybody. My name is Svetlana Berdugina, and uh, um, I will start talking about subgroup one. And it will be three of us talking, also Heidi Korkanin and um, Alexander Shapiro will follow my short presentation. And we talk uh, on behalf of the entire group, uh, subgroup one, stellar and photospheric and chromospheric heterogeneities. Yeah, that's our topic. This uh, group has a task. It was defined uh, uh, by our uh, leaders. Uh, and uh, these are the questions. Basically, our group is uh, um, tasked with, uh, with a study of our overall knowledge of stellar proper properties uh, in the photosphere and the chromosphere, and how these uh, known properties uh, of spots and facula uh, from the sun and our stars um, uh, affect uh, uh, depend on on different stellar properties and also affect uh, the properties of uh, transition uh, spectroscopy of exoplanets and uh, what kind of limitations we also have in this knowledge so these questions we are going to address in our um, uh, report and this presentation will touch only on a few uh, properties of this and uh, of course, the, the best star we know is the sun. It's our host star for uh, a very important planet for us. Uh, so that is uh, also a very good property of this star. And um, also it's a Rosetta stone for astrophysics, we call it, because uh, processes which we observe in such detail on this star, they have applications not only in stellar astrophysics, but also in ga galactic and um, other uh, active phenomena in the universe. So, and uh, the, this star, which we know so well, uh, it looks differently in different wavelengths. And here are just some snapshots, some uh, examples to show that uh, how the sun phase is changes, changes from uh, X-ray to optical and to uh, microwave and millimeter wavelengths. Uh, if we observe brightness, and this is uh, shown on the top, if we observe, if we measure fluxes in this wavelengths, but we also can measure different uh, parameters on this uh, uh, star, such as velocity, for instance, and magnetic field, and then the star looks uh, also different. So we, like this is in the row below, we see this uh, Doppler velocity distribution, which shows rotation of, uh, of, of the sun, uh, as well as uh, non-radial pulsations and magnetic field as well, which is uh, this black and white different polarities associated with a tiny pore here, which you cannot probably see on your screen, but it's there. And uh, these are the images from uh, about a day ago. So and the sun is pretty quiet right now, but, uh, but it's, uh, it's activity is increasing. Uh, so when we talk about uh, transits and exoplanets uh, in front of the uh, stars, uh, then we can look at sun uh, as a reference again, and that's our task. Uh, so in, in, in the sense of um, what we can see on the sun, we, we uh, distinguish different, different phenomena. And first we start from a quiet sun, and uh, this would be... A, uh, so the general characteristics is that sun has a temperature about 5,800, log G 4.5, and the metallicity zero by definition. But uh, zero means that it's relative to the sun, and uh, so the abundances of chemical uh, elements on the sun is also to play a role here. So when this is a, a a uh, nice movie here showing the um, change of the uh, brightness of granules uh, for about 10 minutes here repairs it several times. And so, and this is only in one wavelength again. And uh, what we learn is that this brightness variations uh, depends on uh, also wavelength uh, and uh, on the position on the disk as well. Uh, what is uh, important as well for transiting um, apply uh, transit measurements is center to limb uh, variation brightness variations and that also depends on the wavelength it depends on structures which we can observe especially on the limb and the image on the right shows you the um, uh, uh, image of the sun in the h alpha 
it's also optical line, but in the core of the H alpha, we see the chromosphere. So this is a difference of the quiet sun between the photosphere and the chromosphere. And we see completely different structures because they form at different heights and uh, the properties of the atmosphere are changed, of course, with the height. And in addition to all this, there are oscillations, which also cause brightness variations on a, a few minute scale and the granules also evolve on a few minute scale. So these are just illustrations of the phenomenon on the quiet sun. And if we go to a more active sun where we see facula, uh, this can be seen in the blue wavelengths with, for instance, calcium, uh, ionized calcium line or uh, in G-band, which contains molecular lines, uh, which are also very sensitive to temperature and brightness. And also uh, in other wavelengths and in other lines, we can see facula. And these facular regions, they are much hotter than uh, the rest of the surface and, and the brighter. And that brightness uh, uh, also depends on the wavelength and on the limb angle and uh, evolves on a few minute scale. Then we have such phenomena, magnetic phenomena also as uh, uh, sunspots uh, and uh, they look also differently in the chromosphere, in the photosphere. So on the right, on the left, we see this uh, little movie of a sunspot um, in the um, also G band for about 430 nanometers. And in H alpha, uh, also a sunspot, not the same sunspot, but a different one, but in, in the also sunspot in the middle there. And the structures, as you see, are completely different. And this is caused by the both uh, structures are caused by a magnetic field, but the regimes, uh, how magnetic uh, pressure uh, changes with respect to the gas pressure in the atmosphere, that changes with the height from the, in the photosphere uh, and in the chromosphere, it's different. And that's why we see plasma moving in the, in the photosphere, in the granulation, uh, plasma moving um, uh, turbulently and uh, in sunspots, it's um, uh, following the magnetic field structures and in the chromosphere, it's also following magnetic field structures. And that's again, depends on the wavelength and uh, um, on the limb position. So now uh, is another interesting phenomena is flares and uh, flares are important. Um, and they uh, happen, uh, they important in many ways. Uh, uh, so they release energy in space and uh, they affect also exoplanets and our planet. And uh, here is also illustration that flares uh, on the sun may last not just a few minutes like small layer flares, but uh, there are big fl flares which can last for hours. Uh, so this uh, was a Halloween storm, very famous in 2003. Uh, on the left, uh, this graph of the X-ray flux variable variations uh, that uh, that was a continuously flaring period of time. And when the planet uh, transiting the flaring region, that's also a change of the brightness and not always white light changes in some lines, uh, like in H-alpha here show an example but uh, some flares can be white light as we know from other stars as well. And from the sun also there was example. So for this part of the, of the presentation, we have one finding is that structures on the sun, they have uh, different brightness at different wavelengths and depending on whether they are magnetic or not and at which height in the atmosphere they form. They evolve on time scales from minutes to months and years. And that's what uh, we consider is very important to learn from the sun. And that will be a benchmark for stellar um, measurements. Then we can proceed to stellar uh, um, structures and this will be presented by Heidi. Yes, thank you, Svetlana. So as we saw these beautiful images from the solar surface, of course, for stars, we don't really have that kind of information, that detailed information. On the other hand, we can make images of stellar surface, even uh, sunspot-like uh, structures. We have been doing this for a couple of decades using Doppler imaging from high resolution uh, spectroscopy. And now recently also with interferometric imaging at the uh, infrared wavelength. So here is a beautiful image of uh, gay giant uh, Zeta Andromeda imaged by Merck instrument on Chara by Rachel Rottenbacher and her collaborators. So here we see that, I mean, 
This is a very active star. It has very large spots. It also has this persistent polar spot, which we don't see on the sun. But of course, on the, I mean, I mean, on a, we don't, I mean, you don't look at this kind of stars when you do transmission spectroscopy, you want something less active. So actually what we know about in detail about stellar magnetic activity comes mostly from uh, active stars, which are not something that we would do transmission spectroscopy on. So what, do we, what can we learn from stars in general that goes more into statistics and uh, different kinds of uh, proxies? So I mean, Svetlana, maybe you can change the slide to the next one. So for example, we well, very well know that the activity depends on the stellar age. So here on the left side, you see a plot from uh, Alina Vidotta's paper, where she plots the mean magnetic field strength obtained from Zeeman Doppler images and plots it against with stellar age. So you can see that the mean magnetic field strength goes down older the star is. And we also very well know that the magnetic activity causes magnetic breaking, which makes the stars rotate slower. And of course, the activity level depends on the rotation. The dynamo works better, faster the star is rotating. So on the right side, you see sort of an illustration of this. So you have the X-ray luminosity as a proxy of activity plotted against the Rossby number, which is the stellar rotation period divided by the convective turnover time, which very well correlates how well the dynamo is working. So you can see that if, the, if it's rapid rotation, you actually have a saturation in the activity. So you don't get more active, you reach some level of activity. But if you have a slower rotation, then uh, you can start to see that the activity level goes down. And here in this plot, the red points are fully convective stars and the gray points are partially convective stars. So you can see that actually fully convective M dwarfs behave the same way as partially convective stars. So we now know that, I mean, yes, rotation depends on age and the activity depends on rotation. And also the magnetic field strength depends on age. So Svetlana, if you go to the next plot, uh, slide, then we can also look at the star spot lifetime. So here, this is a um, plot from uh, Namekata et al. paper from uh, last year to 2020. And here the black and gray points are sunspots. So the maximum area plotted against, I mean, and the lifetime against the lifetime. Yeah. Oh, the lifetime plotted against the maximum uh, area. And here they have added some information on star spots. So the Red and blue points are from Namekata paper 2019, where they looked at basically all the Kepler data and tried to find the star spot lifetimes from the high precision Kepler light curves. But of course, they can, could only do that for some stars. So, I mean, the sample is some uh, 50, 60 individual star spots. And then also there are plots from uh, some individual stars like Kepler-17 with stars here. And you the takeaway message is that the lifetime of the star spots is in these measurements is 10 to 350 days with the spot areas being 0.1 to 2.3% of the solar hemisphere. And actually they are not exactly following the empirical uh, sunspot uh, lifetime area relation. So they are not exactly following that, but of course that could be partly due to not resolving all the details on the surface. So if you go to the next slide. So then we can also look at, uh, are these stars dominated by star I mean spots? So dark regions or by faculty bright regions. And here is a paper from uh, Reinhold et al. 
where they looked at uh, Mount Wilson uh, chromospheric emission, compared the cycles in those to photometric cycles on ground-based photometry. And they could see that you had, I mean, the, I mean, this has been shown by other people too, but this is the, I mean, the most recent result. So that, I mean, when you have younger stars, you have, uh, they are spot dominated. So here you have these, uh, like the blue line is uh, 300 mega year line. And then you have a black dust line, 800 mega years. And the red line is 2.5 giga years. So you can see that the, so that the vac facula dominated. So the stars that have, I mean, the photospheric brightness is higher during the, maximum of the activity, they are the older stars. So it seems that stars that are older than two and a half giga years, more or less, they tend to be facular dominated. So they get brighter with um, more magnetic activity. Whereas the other, I mean, younger stars get, tend to get dimmer. Okay, and then next slide, Svetlana. There are also, of course, non-magnetic features. So you can have a, Sort of a granulation flicker so you have granulation of course and that causes noise in your light curves and uh, that noise is usually i mean here plotted from kepler data and uh, taking the rms from eight hours observations i mean time scales of eight hours or less and then uh, plotted against astro seismic uh, log g value actually so that actually this uh, granulation flicker correlates very well with the log G. But you can also see that this granulation flicker, which is at the level of parts per thousand, it gets higher with, I mean, uh, I mean, it lower log G. So, I mean, larger stars. And then you, of course, have also solar like oscillations, but they are, and here is a plot showing some 500 stars, Kepler, where Kepler has observed solar like oscillations. But these are variations are at the parts per million level and the time scales of few minutes. So these are sort of the time scales we are looking at. So you have very short time scale oscillations, you have a bit larger, a longer time scale flicker, and then you have the magnetic activity with the longer scales. So if you should want to go to the next slide. So the finding from the stars is that many of the lower activity stars, so the stars that we are mostly interested in for transmission spectroscopy, they are actually faculty dominated. And we do not know that much about faculty on other stars. We know a bit more about spots. And so here, I mean, we get the details from the sun and we get some statistics from the stars. And then we have simulations to bridge these two. So Sasha, your turn. <laughs> Thank you very much, Hayden. Yes, yeah. So my task for the next couple of minutes is to bring you to a bright world of simulations and a dark world of invitation faults. Next, please, Sveta. Yeah. So there are a number of codes for realistic simulations of stellar and solar atmospheres. And uh, I will not be able to obviously review them for the next couple of minutes and even more I would definitely be a wrong person for this. So my task is much more modest. Basically, I will show you a couple of applications which might be useful for transit spectroscopy. And most of the examples I will show that performed well, simulations for them are performed with the Muram code. Uh, well, simply because I'm working in the Institute where this code is being actively developed. Next, please, Sveta. So as we know, uh, independently of when and where we look at the sun, we can always see magnetic fields there. Yeah? So as has been shown by Sveta in one of her first slides, the sun is never free from the magnetic field. And already like a couple of decades ago, it was suggested that these magnetic fields are brought about by so-called small scale dynamo. So it's dynamo which operates just underneath 
the surface by the convective motion underneath the surface. And there have been several attempts to simulate this dynamo. And here I show uh, two pictures from the most recent paper by Matthias Rengel. So what we see on the left is basically structure of the horizontal magnetic field and the optical surface. And one can see that even so, like we don't have any real activity, yeah, we don't have any input from the from the bottom of the convective zone, we see quite significant magnetic field. Yeah, and the average value of the magnetic field is roughly 70 Gauss, uh, which is actually agrees quite well is available solar observations. Yeah. And then on the right, we see the brightness structures of the quiet sun. And of course, most of the bright structure has nothing to do with the magnetic field. So it just uh, comes from the convective motion. But what is important for us here that this small scale dynamo does modify this pattern. Yeah, it's modifying this inhomogeneity of the pattern what we see. And for example, we know now that sun, like what recent simulations have shown, that the sun becomes roughly half a percent brighter. Uh, in simulations with SSD than with non-magnetic setup. So this SSD, the small scale dynamo, is actually in charge of quite a significant change of the solar brightness. Next slide, say that please. Yep, so basically the takeaway message from here is that magnetic fields are present on surfaces of even the most inactive stars and they affect stellar radiation, for example, limb darkening, yeah, which is crucial for the retrieval of planetary radiosa. They will be talked by Nadia Castagris, yeah, who will talk about that just in roughly an hour. And also this magnetic field that reduces phase inhomogeneities, yeah, which are crucial for analysis the profiles from transit spectroscopy. Then uh, in our institute, we are now doing uh, rather intense simulations of this of the surface of the SSD for various stars. And what we can see that this efficiency of the small scale dynamo strongly depends on the spectral class and on metallicity. So obviously we are going to have different effects depending on the fundamental parameters of stars we are looking in. Next slide, please, Vietnam. So now I am moving from this inactive stars to more active stars, when basically we have some activity which is coming from the global dynamo, yeah, which is responsible for the activity cycles of stars. And presumably, this magnetic field forms, well, depending on the school you belong, people would think that it forms either in the bottom of the convective zone or somewhere distributed in the convective zone. So what happens, this magnetic field, it emerges on uh, stellar surfaces in the form which might be well described by the flux tubes. That's something what is shown on the left. And this flux tube, the magnetic field, basically inhibits the convection, uh, the uh, flow of convective energy. And then, depending on the size of this flux tube, the feature, what we put on the step surface, will be a dark or bright. And it can become bright basically because of this. Uh, a one, uh, so this magnetic feature is embedded in the stellar surface and uh, it might be heated through the hot walls by warmer radiation. Yeah, that's what is shown on this picture. And if, mag and if flux tube is small, so we have relatively large area of this hot walls to the uh, overall volume of the magnetic feature, then it becomes bright. So ensembles of these features, we call them facula. If the magnetic field is larger, we would see pore. And if the magnetic field is even, if the flux tubes is even larger, we would see some inclination of the magnetic fields close to this uh, uh, flux tube, and we would form spots. And uh, for a long time, to calculate 
to calculate spectra of this magnetic features, yeah, because that's basically what is important for them. Here, people had to rely on 1D semi-empirical models. And one of the main problems of this 1D models, why it's difficult to rely on them for stellar modeling, is that they were basically created by hands to reproduce solar observations. Then next slide, Sveta, please. And with a number of black or white magic, what uh, some of us could recently do is to model the behavior of these facular features. Here is 1D geometry, so as I said, it's a little bit of black magic. But what uh, we could do is to model the contrasts of these magnetic features for stars with different metallicities. So what is shown here is a ratio between facular and uh, quite uh, intensity somewhere in the intermediate disk position as a function of the wavelengths. So one could see that it has a very noisy structure because of the from buffer lines. And what is important here is that one could see that it strongly depends on the metallicity of a star. Yeah? So for stars with larger metallicity, the contrast of magnetic features is substantially larger. And this obviously is going to have important applications for transit spectroscopy simply because, uh, well, we now know that at least for hot Jupiters, most of the hot Jupiters are observed around stars with metallicity larger than the sun. So one should definitely take this behavior, take into account this dependence of contrast on the metallicity. Next slide, Sveta, please. And I think I will miss skip it. Next slide, please. Yep, and as I said, that was done with a black magic. Now we are also trying to run simulations without any magic, so real 3D simulations of magnetic features on stellar surfaces. And what is shown here, uh, that's from paper by Charlotte Norris based on simulations of Beck et al with Moram code, that's basically the distribution of stellar of spectra close to the disk center. Yeah. So basically it's distribution of all these homogeneities. Yeah. So and one could see that on the left plot, basically we see quite some, so no magnetic field. So basically what we see here it's mainly granulation. Yeah. And then on the right, we look at the active sun, so the sun with facula. And we see that this distribution is getting significantly broader. Yeah? So, and one should also note here that these pictures are done for the disk center and the effect from the magnetic field are not strongest at the disk center. So when we move to the limb, we expect to see even stronger effects. So we would see significant effect of the magnetic field on this inhomogeneities, yeah, crucial for the transit spectroscopy. Next slide, Seta, please. Uh, yes, that's a simulation of star spot, but there will be a talk by Mayuk Panya uh, just after this talk, so I will skip it and let's go to the last slide. Yes, that's basically as a finding what we had to come up, which is important for us. So that magnetic field is present on surfaces of even the most inactive stars and the magnetic field, whether it originates from the small scale dynamo or from uh, global dynamo, it affects properties of stellar surfaces. And what is important, the effect of the magnetic field strongly depends on the fundamental parameters of stars. That's me. That's all from my side. And I think Sveta will yes, now wrap it up. There is, uh, yes, and we would like to thank you, Sasha and Heidi. Uh, we would like to finish this talk with only showing a, a couple of plots uh, illustrating the dependence of uh, the statistical, uh, what for the planets we have and stars, so the uh, kind of uh, statistical distribution, it's not dependence, it's distribution of planetary radius with effective temperature of a host star. So we, we see this that uh, above about 0.35 uh, uh, Jupiter radii planets, we have uh, host stars in the interval uh, like uh, this K and G, G stars mainly, which hosting the stars. And uh, these are the, will be the target stars for JWST 
uh, transmission spectroscopy. As concerned the metallicity, Sasha also mentioned that, that we have uh, mostly host stars with a higher metallicity, although there are, of course, a few with low metallicity. So that dependence of structures and brightness of mag uh, magnetic structures on metallicity is important here. And uh, on the age, this is what Heidi was showing that most stars are uh, older, um, so then say 300 million years, like she was pointing out. Yes, uh, of course, there are also younger stars, but uh, most of these stars will be factory dominated. Therefore, our conclusion uh, overall, uh, we formulate as a roadmap to exoplanet host stars, basically uh, to understand the variability of these host, host stars and effects of of the variability on transit spectroscopy, we see that it's necessary to extrapolate first from the sun, what we know at high resolution, then to infer statistical properties from stellar statistics and uh, bridge these findings with simulations. And in the end, what is also important to verify this uh, statistically uh, and extrapolated and simulated findings with the results of specific observations of host stars. And that would be a, a task for other subgroups. Thank you for your attention.